Segment 7, Copernicus and the Heliocentric Model. In the last segment, we discussed the geocentric model of the universe invented by the Greeks, the model in which the Earth is the center and the planets and the stars are on fixed spheres that center around this. Nicholas Copernicus, who was born in 1473 and died in in 1543 spent many years developing an alternative model of the universe at which this in which the sun was at the center this model is much simpler than the geocentric model of ptolemy it doesn't require any of these epicycles and equants and deference that we have in the other model and it m most importantly it furnishes a natural explanation of retrograde motion copernicus did not publish his model until the year of his death because it was so contrary to the common belief at the time, he feared he would get in trouble with the church. But the work, including this model, was published in 1543. This picture shows something that we illustrated before, which was the phenomenon of the motion of the planets against the background stars. This picture is very nice. It's, it's, it's photographs of Mars taken once a week over a period of about eight months, showing the gradual progression of Mars from west to east, so it's moving eastward, then it slows down, turns around and moves westward in the retrograde motion, and then resumes its eastward motion, ending it at the end of April there. It'll continue to the east now until the next time that, that the Earth and Mars are on the same side of the sky again. The heliocentric model provides a natural explanation of retrograde motion in the Copernican system, which you can't do with the geocentric model. In this image, in this picture here, you see the Sun at the bottom and with the Earth and Mars both circling it counterclockwise. If you, in, and then what you see is that a series of times set up lines drawn from the Earth through Mars to the distant background stars. In the beginning, as the Earth moves towards, more or less towards Mars, more or less along its line of sight, but Mars continues to move off to the east, the, it, it, it uh, looks like it's moving to the east on the sky. But at a certain point between C and E, the Earth, which is moving more quickly, catches up with Mars and passes it. And during this time, the Mars appears in projection to move backwards, to move in retrograde off to the west. Once the Earth has passed Mars and the line of sight between the Earth and Mars is more or less along the direction of the uh, along the direction of the line of sight, the eastward motion of Mars ca again causes it to appear to move to the east. This is a picture from uh, Copernicus's book *De Revolutionibus*. There's a copy of this book in the um, in the rare books collection at UT, which we've seen actually at some exhibits. It's it's quite amazing, but this this is a, an an amazing rare thing to have, and and it's quite phenomenal to to look at in person. This is a quote from the book, explaining the essence of the idea with the sun in the middle and the planets moving around it. You can pause here if you want to read it in more detail. Here's the problem: Copernicus's model simplifies the explanation of retrograde motion, but it does a lousy job of predicting the future positions of the planets, worse in fact than the updated Ptolemaic model. So how can it be right and bad at the same time? The problem with Copernicus's model is Copernicus took one idea from the Greeks that turns out to be incorrect, that is this beauty of perfect circles and perfect spheres, and he put the planets in motion at constant velocity along circular orbits. And since this is not in fact the way things work, it does a very bad job of predicting the future positions of the planets, whereas the Ptolemaic uh, astronomers who had this ability to put in a lot of cranks and levers and bells and whistles to make things work, they could adjust things to, to have it work out, even though physically it wasn't a particularly good model. To get from the Copernican model to a more correct view of the solar system, we needed better measurements that could actually be used to test ideas about how things actually worked. This came about in the period just after Copernicus's death, when Tycho Brahe, an astronomer at the Danish court, 
uh, made very precise measurements over many years of the positions of the planets against the distant background stars. He was you could consider him to be the last of the great naked eye astronomers since his measurements were made up till the era just before the invention of the telescope. The King of Denmark provided Tycho with an observatory on the island of Ven, which sits in the in the Baltic Sea. It's an observatory called Uraniborg, which we see here in these illustrations. This elaborate observatory was used for many, many years. It's kind of amazing when you think about it now, because my picture of Denmark in the winter is cloudy all the time, but somehow he managed to get the job done. This is an illustration of the inside of his observatory at Uraniborg, and you see Tycho pointing at the slit in the wall, and this 90-degree uh, arc here, which is used to measure the altitude of the objects coming through by sliding that bar that's in the center right up and down to adjust it, and you see a clock and a man at a desk, and as the stars and planets move through the slot, the time was noted down and the altitude of the object as they went across the central meridian. Tycho recorded 20 years of highly accurate positions for the naked eye planets. That was a far better collection of data than had ever existed before th that time. Tycho, unfortunately, was not able to make a clean break from the Ptolemaic model and came up with a kind of a hybrid between c the Copernican model and the Ptolemaic model. And, and, and this had the, the Sun orbiting the Earth, but the other planets orbiting the Sun. Uh, this idea quickly came, ran, was an also ran, but it, it, it was a little historical sidelight that came from this great observer. In our next segment, we'll see how these data got used to really find the answer to the problem, to really solve the problem once and for all of the model of the solar system.